worship this morning, wasn't it? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Yes. You know, as a church family, as an outpost church family, one of the ways that you could uh, describe us, the, the terminology we've used a little bit in the past, is that we are, we are real people. You know, we believe in authenticity and honesty and just transparency. We are real people who believe in real change because of a real Savior. And we have so many people in our midst that could uh, give testimony to how that is true. And I, I asked John Moore, John, would you come down and, and share a little bit of your story and your heart with us? Um, most of you have met John at the front door. <laughs> He's always out there welcoming us and handing out uh, handouts and getting us uh, welcomed in, into the atmosphere here. And John, I have really enjoyed having you in the men's Bible study in, on Monday night. And... Some of you were uh, with us in the baptism service last year, and, and John was there as well. You got baptized. That, that was a thrill. That was such a privilege. Yeah. But can you take a minute and tell how did you come to the place where you discovered Jesus, and how did you make Jesus your Lord? What was the process there? Basically, I was at my darkest, um, and I'd lost everything, and I didn't understand why. Until, um, until I met uh, Eddie Heffington, and he gave me my first Bible and explained to me about the new wineskins mm. and how basically I had to, you know, become a new wineskin in order to take in the new wines, and everything's just been so much better ever since. Wow. Changed my entire life. Because I'm not torn between um, two directions anymore. I've got a straight path now. That's amazing. I didn't know that part of your story with the wineskins. Yeah. That's actually in our passage today. <laughs> That's so cool. Uh, thanks for sharing that. What was the situation? Where did you, where did you meet Eddie and what was going on there? Uh, I met him in jail. Uh, like I said, I was at my darkest. And he... He got me my first Bible, actually, mm -hmm. and yeah, very grateful for that. Thanks for being real and honest. <laughs> yeah, no problem. But that's where you met Jesus. That's where I met Jesus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How has how has he changed you? How has he given you those new wineskins? What what are those? What's that look like for you? How has he changed your life? Uh, purpose, mm -hmm. giving me a new purpose in life. Mm -hmm. oh. No longer torn between what I think I should do or what I really should do because it's plain and simple right in front of me. And you're doing it. I'm doing it. Anybody that knows John can testify to that. He's, he's right. doing it. He's walking it out. Yeah, he is. And is the change that God is bringing in your life, is that real? How do you know it's real? Uh, I know it's real because I can feel it. Mm. Not just um, think that it's, that it's real. I can really feel it right here. And... I don't know other, any other way to explain it than I can feel it. Mm. And every day i um, shown that my path is straight. You've got a new business or meeting new people in town. Yep. God is blessing your life. Most definitely. And it is a fun thing to see. <laughs> Thank you. For us are getting to know you. So, John, can I pray for you? Yeah. Thank Lord, you. we're just so thankful for John, what you've done in his life. He just stands up here this morning as a, as a testimony to your grace and your goodness. And there are many people in this room that could testify the same. That you bring us out of those places of brokenness and hopelessness and darkness. In those places when we reach the end of ourselves and you rescue us. You deliver us. You save us and you give us new purpose. You're the one that brings the new wineskins for the new wine. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for the changes that you bring about in our lives. And I thank you for John. I thank you for his story. I thank you that it's really wrapped up in your bigger story. You have given him purpose and life and blessing. And we're thankful to join in praying for him today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for sharing that. I know there's a bunch of people in the room that could testify the same that when you came to faith in Jesus, things got real, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. And he gives us new eyes to see. 
He gives us ears to hear. He gives us a renewed voice to be able to speak truth. He's changing us. He's transforming us to be more and more like him. He's working his will in our lives to get us ready for the kingdom and to live out the kingdom in our daily lives right now. We want to look at some stories that express that today and lean into that a little bit. Lean with me into Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 to 34. I'd like to read that for us. It's also printed in your handout, or you can flip your cell phone to this passage. Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 to 34. One day the disciples of John the Baptist came to Jesus and asked him, Why don't your disciples fast like we and the Pharisees do? And Jesus replied, Do wedding guests mourn while celebrating the, with the groom? Of course not. But someday the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. Besides, who would patch old clothing with new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the old skins would burst from the pressure, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wine is stored in new wineskins, so that both are preserved. And as Jesus was saying this, the leader of the synagogue came <coughs> and knelt before him. My daughter has just died, he said, but you can bring her back to life if you just come and lay your hand on her. So Jesus and his disciples got up and went with him. Just then, a woman who had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding came up to him. She touched the fringe of his robe, for she thought, If I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be encouraged. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was healed at that moment. When Jesus arrived at the official's home, he saw the noisy crowd and heard the funeral music. Get out, he told them. The girl isn't dead, she's only asleep. But the crowd laughed at him. After the crowd was put outside, however, Jesus went in and took the girl by the hand, and she stood up. The report of this miracle swept through the entire countryside. After Jesus left the girl's home, Two blind men followed along behind him, shouting, Son of David, have mercy on us. They went right into the house where he was staying, and Jesus asked them, Do you believe I can make you see? Yes, Lord, they told him, we do. And then he touched their eyes and said, Because of your faith, it will happen. Then their eyes were opened, and they could see. Jesus sternly warned them, Don't tell anyone about this. But instead they went out and spread his fame all over the region. When they left, a demon-possessed man couldn't, who couldn't speak was brought to Jesus. So Jesus cast out the demon. And then the man began to speak. The crowds were amazed. Nothing like this has ever happened in Israel, they exclaimed. But the Pharisees said, he can cast out demons because he is empowered by the prince of demons. Well, you have to feel sorry for the Pharisees, don't you? They just didn't get it. They couldn't see the truth of who Jesus is and what he came to do. But we know that Jesus is a real Savior. I want to start with this today. Jesus is a real Savior. He's a real Savior who brings real change into our lives. Jesus came to save us. We sang about it this morning. That song set was so marvelous. It, it preached the gospel in a wonderful way, the song set that we sang during, during worship. Jesus came to save us. It was declared from the very early time of his birth in the stable. The angel declared it. You are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Now as we've been going through the book of Matthew, we saw in Matthew chapters 5 through 7, this uh, Sermon on the Mount where Jesus was teaching the people what real faith looks like, what it looks like to be a, a real disciple of his, what that looks like. And in chapter 7 verse 28, at the end of that Sermon on the Mount, it was, it was said this, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority. Quite unlike their teachers of the religious law. They were teaching under some man-made human authority. Jesus had real authority because he is the real savior. He's the real king. He really is who he says he is. 
And then, coming down from the mountain on that time of teaching, Jesus showed his authority. He displayed his healing power to a bunch of people. He healed a bunch of people. He showed his power over the wind and the waves in that scene in the boat when he told the waves and the wind to be calm, and they were. He showed his authority by healing and casting out evil spirits. He did amazing things. He did real miracles because he is the one and only real king. And so Matthew 9, as we started chapter 9 last week, Matthew chapter 9 starts with that word, that most powerful name of all, Jesus. That's how Matthew 9 starts. And now we're coming to more scenarios that declare his goodness and his power and his compassion. We left off last week with the calling of Matthew and how Jesus was accused of eating with a bunch of scumbag sinners. And Jesus replied to them in Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. They know we're scumbags. We know that we need a Savior. In other words, when people are real about their need for a Savior and follow his call to real faith, then things begin to happen, begin to happen for us. We need to get real about our need for a Savior. And when we stop hiding and admit the truth and call out to Jesus to be our Savior, things begin to change. So when we get real, real people, real people with real faith will experience real change. We see this in, in verse 14 as it unfolds. One day the disciples of John the Baptist came in to Jesus and asked him, why don't your disciples fast like we and the Pharisees do? This question about fasting is about much more than just fasting. It's really about all their religious practices, all the things that they were doing. It's really about more than just the question of fa fasting. The Jesus followers are learning that Hey, the important thing isn't all these rules and regulations and religious practices. The important thing is relationship with a real Savior. Relationship with Jesus. Relationship with, with God. Love for God that overflows into love for people and building relationships with other people. So what's really behind the question in verse 14 is this. Why don't you do all the religious stuff we do? That's really the heart of the question. Why don't you act like us? The real question is, why don't you do things like we do? Why aren't you like us? Are you trying to things? Are you trying to change things up? The old wineskins are fine. Pause for a moment for an application, because for us, for you, and for me. Everywhere you turn, you are going to encounter religious people and, and even Christians who will criticize you for not doing like they do. Have you encountered that? You don't worship the same way they do. You don't pray as much as they do, perhaps. You don't, go, you don't make sure you're in a worship service every week. You don't vote for the same political party they do. You don't believe the same exact way they do about the end times. You're just not following what they <laughs> believe. And Have you encountered it? If you haven't, you will. It's prevalent still in our time. You may not have, you might feel it when people expect you to do like they do in a, in a church setting. Why don't you do the things that I do? Why don't you do the ministries that I do? Why don't you have the same gifts that I do? Whatever expression that takes, we so quickly and so easily expect others to be like us, don't we? Yes. And others will impose that upon us. So it's a good thing to be aware of and respond with compassion because often the criticism is subtle. Sometimes it's passive aggressive. Sometimes it's not even expressed, but you can feel it. You don't dress the same way I do. You know, whether you tuck your shirt in or leave your shirt tucked up, whatever the expectations would be, what, what's the version of the Bible you read? You might be criticized for reading the wrong version of the Bible. Maybe the songs you sing in church, how often we celebrate communion, the activities that you participate in or don't participate in, whether you're politically passive or join an insurrection or wear a blue tie or a red tie. 
you will feel the criticism. The car you drive, the food you, food you eat, the things you drink or don't. Here's the thing. Here's the point. What Jesus is pointing to is not just about rules and regulations and expectations. It, it is about relationship with Jesus. And that overflows into relationship with other people. Being real in relationships. Being true. Being honest. Being authentic. That builds relationships when we're honest with each other. And we're just real about our need together to follow the Savior. And go deeper into His grace. So in verse 14, their question has more behind it than you might see it at first with application for us. So look at the response of Jesus in verse 15. He responds immediately in chapter 9, verse 15. Jesus replied, Do the wedding guests mourn while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. Yet someday the groom will be taken away from him, and then they will fast. There's so much just in that one verse. He's pointing to the need for relationship with him. Following him. That's what's crucial. Without that, we're just following empty rules. With that, we can follow things and walk in obedience because we have a relationship with him. He gives this picture of a wedding, which is something joyful, something to celebrate. And he is saying, saying that he is the groom. And we are the bride. That's the picture that he's painting there. He's the groom. And we are the bride. And he's saying, you know, the, bride, the bridegroom is going to be taken away. The cross is coming is what we know. The resurrection is coming. And his return is coming. And in, while he was with them, you know, it was about being with him. Now, after he's gone, after the cross and after the resurrection, all the spiritual activities we participate in, like prayer and worship and fasting and giving and spending time with each other in fellowship, all those things we do, walking in obedience... Those are things we do to stay connected with Him. Those are things that we participate in that are really important to keep our connection with Him and to grow deeper in Him. They're really valuable now for us. That's what He's saying. The, the, bride, the bridegroom will be taken away. And then all these religious activities will be about staying connected in relationship with Jesus. And we participate in things that help us to do that. And it all looks forward to Revelation 19, where you get this picture of the wedding feast of the bride. Read about that sometime. It's a wonderful picture. We are the bride. Jesus is the bridegroom. He's the groom. We are the bride, and there will be that day ahead where we have this wonderful wedding banquet of celebration and joy as we are with him in a very real sense once again. In the process... We stay connected with him, and in that, he changes us. He transforms us. He is preparing his bride, of which we are a part. He is getting us ready for that great celebration. He is making us more and more like Jesus. He is changing us, and he is the only one who can change us. So if we want real change, we need to be real about our need and become people of real faith, because Jesus brings something new and he brings forth two great images there the new cloth and the new wine skins in, in verses 16 and 17 you see we sang about it this morning the gospel does not fit with the old sacrificial system because he is the perfect sacrifice he came to be the sacrifice that's what we will remember at communion as we celebrate that together we remember he is the sacrifice that takes care of all previous sacrificial system he is the perfect lamb the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And as we follow him, he takes us to new places of faith. Because as he says later in Luke 2.20, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And in 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. We just can't go back and patch up the old stuff. There's a newness in the air. I think you know this. We desperately need renewal. Yes. 
Do you agree? Yes. yes. Do you think our country needs renewal? Yes. Do you think our nation is in trouble? I could, I could rattle off a long list of things that I've seen over the last 30 years in, in my life as a minister. The, the, the things that have changed in our I could rattle off a, a long list of how deeply in trouble our country is. But you know it. You feel it. You know that our nation needs renewal. And you also know that starts with us. That starts with me. I need renewal. I need to get real with my own issues. I need to get real with my desperate need for a Savior. I need to get real with my need to be renewed by the heart of Jesus in order to live in a contagious way so that others can meet Him. Because without Him, it will get worse and worse and worse. We desperately need renewal. And as we lead into that, Jesus changes our life. So, so how does that happen? There's some great models in this scripture for us today that really put on display real faith. Here's what real faith, here's what it looks like when real people come forward with real faith, real faith in Jesus and he does things. Here's where I believe it starts. Real faith starts with surrender. That's what it looks like to have real faith. Surrender. Absolute, complete surrender. It's modeled by this guy in our passage in verse 18. He knelt he leaned down in worship before who he knew Jesus was, the real Savior, the real Messiah. You know, I, I did a little word study in the word knelt or worship in some translations. The original word for that, really you could translate it literally, it means kiss toward, like throwing a kiss toward. See, in that ancient culture, you know, it, it was common to kiss each, other, kiss, kiss each other on the cheek. Uh, you know, Paul talked about that. Give, greet each other with a holy kiss. It was just part of that ancient culture. Unless a person was really significantly inferior in rank to the person that you're greeting, then it's kneeling down and like throwing kisses. <laughs> I mean, you're on your knees and you're throwing kisses. This is an act of reverence to the person who is far superior to me that Jesus is. This man demonstrates something significant. Kneeling down in complete surrender, and we do the same. We kneel down in complete surrender, and it's like we're throwing holy kisses of prayer to God in honor and reverence to Him. Now, I don't, if your knees are bad, you probably don't do that too often. But here's the thing. It does not matter what the posture of our body really is, as long as the posture of our heart is one of kneeling in complete surrender before Jesus, the one who is the King the one who is the only real savior of the world. And when I do that, things begin to change. There's something about that kneeling. When in our heart, we're kneeling before him, recognizing him as a real savior. And that's where our journey really begins, of understanding what it looks like to have a renewed heart, to be giving renewed wineskins so that my life can handle the new wine that Jesus brings in his new Covenant. So real faith starts with surrender. Real faith also looks like reaching out to Jesus. This is demonstrated by this lady in verses 19 through 22. This woman put on display real faith when she reached out and touched his cloak. And Jesus knew that that happened, that she had reached out and touched his robe. And he stopped and turned toward her and spoke to her. Boy, what an encouraging application for every one of us. I guarantee you the scripture is clear. When we take that posture of reaching out to Jesus and we're kneeling in submission to him and surrender to him and we're reaching out to him, I guarantee you he's right there and he knows it's happening. And he will turn toward us and he will speak to us. We will learn the voice of the shepherd as it says in James 4, 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It's a promise. He will. For this woman, she reached out to Jesus and she heard those wonderful, powerful words. Daughter. Family language. Daughter. Intimacy. Relationship. Daughter. Be encouraged. Your faith has made you well. She had real faith. So she experienced transformative, real change in her life. She was healed, changed, made new. 
And when we kneel before Jesus and reach out to him and grab onto him, we are grabbing onto the king of the universe and he knows that we're right there and he's speaking to us and we get deeper in our understanding of who he is and we trust him more because he is the God of the impossible. In those moments when we don't think there's hope for my renewal, he is the God of the impossible. And all he asks is surrender, reach out to him, trust him with real faith, things happen. Things change. Something else that real faith looks like. Real faith looks like standing in the kingdom music of new life. In this, in this passage in verses 23 through 26, there was, there was this noise. They get to the place where the, the man requested healing for his daughter. There was this, all, all this noise, this weeping and wailing, and funeral music. And Jesus is like, quiet, get out. This is not about death. This is about a renewed life. And he healed this gal. And she stood up with renewed life and went forth to walk a journey of obedience to him. Real faith was profound for her, bringing to her new life. And that same Jesus is available to us. That same Jesus can be as real to us, wherever you are. And then Jesus encounters some blind guys, and they showed us what real faith looks like. Real faith looks like persistence in prayer. Did you catch it when we read it in verses 27 through 29? These blind men were following Jesus, and they were persistent. They stayed with Jesus. They followed him right into the house where he was staying. They were persistent. And Jesus asked them if they believed. And they said yes. And Jesus said, because of your faith, it will happen. They had real faith. They believed that Jesus could heal them. They were persistent in asking for that healing. They cried out to him for mercy, and Jesus opened their eyes to see. Such a wonderful, profound fulfillment to prophecy that actually happened here. I think that's why Matthew recorded it. The other Gospels don't, but this is so profound. In the Old Testament, the prophet said, the blind will see. And we, by the way, you know this, we are blind until Jesus opens our eyes to see. And then we see reality we see the world from god's perspective we see with wisdom and what i hope it stirs in us when we see what's really going on what stirs in us is a, comp a compassion for people and a desire to pray to be persistent in prayer to pray with gratitude for what god is doing in my life to pray for the people around me that don't know him to pray for my country <laughs> and to pray for my nation and I would take a guess that some of us in the room have probably backed off from our prayers for our country and our leaders and our nations because you're at that place. It's like, there's no hope. There's always hope. That's right. And so we persist in prayer. We continue to pray. And we believe that God is at work. And I believe he is. I believe he's raising up a kingdom army Amen. to go forth and make a difference. To be praying for a nation, to be praying for our people, to be praying for those around us and be expectant, be optimistically expectant in those prayers, prayers of real faith, even as we're really honest and realistic about our situation. And as we do that, God grows our faith as he changes us and gives us that compassion we need for others. And here's something else really important about real faith. Real faith speaks. It's not silent. I love this story. It's fascinating. Jesus told these, these, these blind guys in verses 30 and 31, don't tell anyone. He heals them. Don't tell anyone. Can you imagine? They go forth and somebody sees them. <coughs> Weren't you blind? How is it you now see? Can't say. <laughs> Can't tell you. It's a big secret. Maybe that's part of the strategy. When you say, I, I can't tell you, people want to know. They're going to want to lean in. I find it fascinating that Jesus told them, don't tell anybody about this. But he didn't say, don't tell anybody about me. They couldn't not tell people about Jesus. And it's the same for us. If we have been transformed by faith in Jesus and we're following him, we can't not talk about that. God gives us a renewed voice that has to be spoken. He gives us truth to proclaim. 
the truth of our testimony to reveal. He gives us a voice to speak. And when we do that, we experience real change because Jesus is a real Savior. And we live that out in a way that others see it. And then in verses 32 through 34 there, Jesus cast out a demon from a man who couldn't speak. And then the man began to speak. Jesus gave him a voice. And then the crowds were amazed. But the Pharisees, but the religious leaders, but those who even had influence over the disciples of John the Baptist, they had a lot of influence, but these religious leaders, they just still couldn't get it. They were opposed to Jesus, accused him of getting his power from the, from the devil, from the enemy. They really were not willing to surrender the, whole, the religious control and all that they had, all their expectations, they were not willing to give that up to embrace the new that Jesus was bringing. It was too much of a stretch for them. And so, really, they had nothing meaningful to say. So what they say is pretty unmeaningful and pretty untrue. God gives us truth that needs to be shared and said and lived out in a contagious way to those around us. And not only that, but we are empowered to do that. Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. He empowers us to speak. By the way, today in the church, you know, the historical traditional church calendar, today is marked for a lot of historical churches as the day of Pentecost. Were you aware of that? Yeah. Today is the day of Pentecost which is expressed in Acts chapter 2, where after Jesus ascended to heaven, he promised them that power would come to give them the, the ability to be witnesses for him. And all of a sudden, when the Spirit came, landed on all the disciples like tongues of fire, and they began to speak in all the languages of the people that were there. And, and they proclaimed, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. It was a miracle that they could speak the wonders of God in the languages of all the people that were there. What a profound miracle. And it was happening in such a way that they thought, they're just drunk. And Peter was like, it's nine in the morning. <laughs> it's morning. They're not drunk. This is happening to fulfill what the prophet Joel said. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all people. What you're seeing here? This is new wine. This is the Holy Spirit of God coming upon us. The Spirit of Jesus. The Spirit to make Jesus real to us. The Spirit who empowers us to be witnesses. We cannot hold that in. The power is to be shared. To participate with God in building the kingdom. This is one of our passions. It's, it's in our name. The Outpost Church. Because we believe in reaching out with the love of Jesus. And bringing change in our lives and in the lives around us, and in the world around us. So as we, we want to take a few moments for communion this morning. And as we enter into that time, a couple of questions to reflect on. If you would get your elements ready and at hand there. Let me just ask, for what do you need to reach out to Jesus? I mean, one of the things that we can do during communion, is, as we remember, is to confess our sins and to remember the cost that Jesus paid at the cross to take care of our sin problem, to pay the penalty in our place. So for what do you need forgiven? For what do you need to reach out to Jesus for? Get real with him this morning. Can I encourage that? If we really understand what Jesus did at the cross and what he accomplished in his resurrection to bring new life, new wine, and a new covenant, we have to be real with ourselves and admit our need, and then we become real people who are experiencing real change because of a real Savior. What do you need to reach out to him for? Reach out to him this morning. Reach out and grab onto him. Reach out and, and touch him. And the other question is, what, what needs to change? If you really think about it and pray about it, ask that question of God, God, what are you seeking to change in my life right now to make me more like Jesus? I guarantee you he's doing something. Because none of us in the room are there yet. We're all being shaped, transformed, and fashioned to be more and more like Jesus. So where is he working in your life right now? Join with him. 
It's a profound experience to experience the power of his change and transformation. And as we participate with him in that, we get to experience the thrill of bringing him glory for it. So what needs to change? Maybe you need to surrender. Maybe you've been, you know, attending church services and you're, you're, you're doing the thing, but maybe you've never actually honestly surrendered to Jesus. That's, that's step one, surrender. That's what open up, opens up the floodgates of heaven. Surrender to Jesus as your Lord and your Savior and your King. Surrender to him. Maybe that's where you need to be this morning. Maybe the change that God is bringing about in your life is more courage to speak. More courage to do like what John did this morning. Just share your story. By the way, that didn't even, he didn't even talk very long, did he? What John said in a very condensed short period of time, what he said in a very short time was powerful. What if all of us just dedicated two to three minutes to speak into the life of another person about my own journey with Jesus and how it's real with me and how Jesus is changing my life? It doesn't need to be a lengthy thing. It can be short and condensed in the moment. If you have opportunity to share your whole story, what we hope it does when we get little opportunities is, is the, wets, the, ap the appetite of people to say, I, I want to hear more. I want to walk with you a while and see how real this is. What if we all embraced that and relied on the power of the Spirit to accomplish it for His glory? So as we take communion this morning, would you just reflect on those questions in what way do you need to reach out to Jesus? And what do you need to trust him for to bring change into your life? If you would access your bread, it says in Luke chapter 22, Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Would you pray with me? Father, we remember, we remember, Jesus, what you did at the cross. You suffered horribly. You died. You had a very real human body that experienced all the pain. You did that because you love us that much. And we remember that this bread represents your body. And so, Lord, before we take it, we just pause for a moment. and We want to get real with you right now. We confess in this moment those things that are not pleasing to you, those things that you want to change. We agree with you. We confess that those things need to be eliminated in our lives. We ask for your forgiveness, and we thank you for it. Thank you that you're so full of grace, and you forgive us when we confess. So we confess the things that we've done. Father, we confess the things that we have thought that were not pure. We confess the things that we have said that may not have been true or might have even been hurtful. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us, Father, for the things that we have failed to do when we should have done them. God, we cry out to you. We're being honest and real with you this morning. Would you forgive us? as we remember what it cost for our forgiveness. And we thank you. We thank you that this represents the body of Christ, broken for me, for us. So we take together in remembrance in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke 22, verse 20 says, After supper he took another cup of wine, and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice. With, with my, an agreement confirmed with my blood, poured out as a sacrifice for you. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the cup and all that this represents. Father, I pray this morning as we think about your forgiveness and your grace and your empowerment and what we remember on this day of Pentecost that you, Lord Jesus, said we'd be empowered to be witnesses. And then you, you, you ascended to heaven and you gave us that power 
It's expressed in the scriptures. You give us a voice to speak in a way that communicates meaningful words to other people. You enable us to speak their language. You enable us. You give us opportunities. You empower us to speak the heart language of the people around us that they might too experience your grace. So God, in this moment, even before we partake, God, as, as we drink this wine in remembrance, as we, as we drink this cup as a remembrance of you and your broken body and your shed blood, Father, would you in this moment fill us anew with your spirit? For each of us, Father, we cry out to you that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. We bow before you, and for some of us, that might be your recognition that you need the Holy Spirit says in the scripture, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be being filled with the Holy Spirit. God, we cry out to you that you will fill us with your spirit and empower us to do what you are calling us to do. Father, help us to pray for each other in that and pray with each other in that to go deeper in our understanding and our experience of the fullness of your spirit in our lives and working through us. We God, bring that new wine. Bring the reality of that new covenant and the power of your spirit as we participate in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take together. Hallelujah.